Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Psychedelic Sacred Medicines Purpose and Business Series. I'm Beth Weinstein. I'm a business coach helping current and aspiring spiritual entrepreneurs align with your purpose and grow your business so you can help more people and create freedom and abundance doing work you love from anywhere. And today I have the honor to be speaking with Paul Stamets. Hi, Paul. Thank you so much for being here. Pleasure to be here, Beth. How are you? Thanks. Great. So I'm going to read through Paul's bio in case you actually don't know who he is, and then we'll go right into the question. So Paul Stamets, speaker, author, mycologist, medical researcher, and entrepreneur, is considered an intellectual and industry leader in fungi, habitat, medicinal use, and production. He lectures extensively to deepen the understanding and respect for the organisms that literally exist under every footstep taken on this path of life. His presentations cover a range of mushroom species and research showing how mushrooms can help the health of people and the planet. His central premise is that habitats have immune systems just like people and mushrooms are cellular bridges between the two. Our close evolutionary relationship to fungi can be the basis for novel pairings in the microbiome that lead to greater sustainability and immune enhance enhancement. Paul's philosophy is that microdiversity is biosecurity. He sees the ancient old growth forest of the Pacific Northwest as a resource of value, especially in terms of fungal genome. A dedicated hiker and explorer, his passion is to preserve and protect as many ancestral strains of mushrooms as possible from these pristine woodlands. His research is considered breakthrough by thought leaders for creating a paradigm shift for helping ecosystems worldwide. Paul is the author of six books, and he has discovered and named numerous new species of psilocybin mushrooms. He has received numerous awards, including Invention Ambassador for the American Association for the Advancement of Science and the National Mycologist Award from the North American Mycological Association. Paul's extensive work in the field of mycology earned him an official induction into the Explorers Club this year. Congrats, Paul. And Paul finds, re, funds research to save rare strains of mushrooms that dwell within the old growth forest. He is a collaborator with numerous scientific organizations and research institutes. And currently he's testing extracts of these rare strains at the National Institutes of Health and with Washington State University and the US Department of Agriculture against a wide panel of viruses pathogenic to humans, animals, and bees. We are now fully engaged in the sixth major extinction on planet Earth. Our biosphere is quickly changing, eroding the life support systems that have allowed humans to ascend. Unless we put in, into action policies and technologies that can cause a course correction in the very near future, species diversity will continue to plummet. With humans not only being the primary cause, but one of the victims, what can we do? Fungi, particularly mushrooms, offer some powerful practical solutions which can be put into practice now. And you can get more information at his website, paulstamets.com. It'll be in, in today's email. Just click it and look around. There's some amazing information there. So Paul, you are just an amazing genius when it comes to mushrooms and mycology. You know, can you tell the quick story of how did you find your purpose? Like what brought you to this, you know, mission? It's beyond a, a career. It's a mission in life. Like what brought you to this point? Well. I, good question. Maybe the mushrooms or Gaia chose me, but I'm one person in a long lineage of experts to go back many thousands of years. So I have a prominent voice today for which I'm grateful. Um, I never expected to be in this position, um, but I followed my heart and my interests, and I was a profound stutterer. I still do stutter a little bit, but if you ever saw the movie, The King's Speech, that was the degree or worse than my stuttering habit. And I, so I didn't look at people in the eyes. I looked at the ground all the time because if I saw a nice looking lady or something and I tried to talk to her, I would embarrass myself and it was humiliating. So I best avoided eye contact and I would just stare at the ground. So I found fossils and mushrooms. <laughs> and um, so I, was very intrigued that mushrooms evoke such a strong uh, reaction by many people, uh, oftentimes a knee-jerk reaction based on ignorance and what I saw as a form of biological prejudice. And so I began to be attracted to that which was forbidden and uh, the forbidden fruit of nature clearly in my mind seemed to be mushrooms. And so the more people 
told me to avoid them, the more interested I was in them. And then my brother, John, went to South America and Mexico and had these incredible journeys on psilocybin mushrooms. I was just 14 years old when he came back and I was the very eager and admired him enormously. He was a mentor of my life. Unfortunately, he, he passed a few years ago. Um, but John um, went on to Yale um, and my brother Bill went on to Cornell. And uh, that's significant. And my sister went on to Ohio State. That's significant because we had a full, fully equipped laboratory in the basement. Um, and I, my brother John was a serious chemist and that's what we got a scholarship on. And, uh, and he would not let me play in the laboratory, but I could, I could sit in the laboratory and listen to the massive radio my dad got from the USS uh, Intrepid aircraft carrier during World War II. And so I got the main uh, uh, radio from the aircraft carrier used in World War II. This is now in the, in the late 1960s. Um, and so I could play with the radio and listen to coded messages behind the Iron Curtain. And, and I could be near my older brother was he was doing his experiments, but he would never let me touch the chemicals because I always wanted to blow things up. And so John went off to college, my brother Bill went off to college, my sister went off to college, and then my twin brother and I had full reins of the laboratory with no supervision. And so we looked up an experiment that said, danger, do not bring near a flame. <laughs> and we made many <laughs> explosive little concoctions. Um, it's amazing we didn't hurt, hurt ourselves or burn down the house. We had a one very close call. Um, so, but anyhow, so I, was intrigued by his experiences with psilocybin mushrooms and it was in the 1960s you know the late 1960s and as many young people have read about you know that was there was a cultural revolution on multiple fronts it was the environmental movement uh is the anti-war movement um it was um respecting racial equality it was uh, the emergence of, of the respect, of the respect for, for, uh, for, the, for, for gay people. And so, um, and, you know, it was at Nixon where he targeted African-Americans uh, specifically, um, uh, focusing on their use of marijuana. The, the, the use of marijuana in the early 1960s really came out of the jazz uh, uh, African-American movement. Um, that was part of their cultural thing, you know. It really emanated out of New Orleans. Many people don't know this. Of course, there's many other epicenters. I'm not saying it's the only one. But what I'm saying is all of us then, uh, that community, were targeted uh, by the conservative Nixon administration as being the enemy. And so they, they had the war against drugs and they put us all in the same bucket uh, and they attacked us um, in so many devious and sinister ways. So it was a huge oppression. The freedom that we enjoy today to be, even be able to talk about the subject is in stark contrast to where we came from. So I want all, you know, we always stand on the shoulders of our ancestors and our teachers, uh, but this is our, we have a new freedom. Um, I think there's a revolution for the freedom of consciousness that's sweeping the world right now. We're all part of this new cultural revolution and we need to band together and do this much more intelligently, much more st strategically than reactionary. Uh, we didn't know of the of the forces that were at play against us. They were, you know, very well funded, uh, very well strategized to suppress our voices. And now I think we're a lot more aware of that. And there's a lot of smart people uh, in academia and um, and otherwise who are who are holding hands together to make sure we can shepherd this sacred knowledge for the best benefit uh, of the commons. Mm, yeah, beautiful, beautiful. <laughs> Short yeah. history lesson there. No, it's, it's great, actually. Um, so, you know, you mentioned a revolution of consciousness, right? And um, doing it smart. So what are your takes on, I mean, you're in the Pacific Northwest. There's a lot of movement out on the West Coast with decriminalization of psilocybin. And there's a ballot measure coming up in Oregon right now. You know, what do you feel that um, the the future looks like? Like, what is what is this growth all about right now? Because it's you know it's all over the mainstream. You know, it's it's coming into the mainstream media more. There's more discussions now. It's almost you know people would say it's like trendy, right? Um, 
But what is your take on this explosive growth and where it comes into play with our society and this, this revolution you mentioned? Well, the, the foundation is science. Uh, this is the, the new foundation that we're building from. Uh, the, the, there's so many studies validating uh, the benefits of psilocybin uh, therapeutically. As you know, against PTSD, uh, depression, anxiety, uh, mood, and also with neurogenesis. And if I may, and I'm a Luddite here, folks, <laughs> it's like I've always, <laughs> friends always say, you always need a 20 or 30 year old when you're trying to do things uh, these days. But I'm going to share a screen if I can. I'm not sure if this is going to work. So um, you have to enable oh, yeah, screen sharing. Okay. Let's see. I can make you. Uh, let's see how to do this. I have done this once. There you go. And um, in momento. There we go. Can you see that? Yes. Okay, I'm going to show th three slides on the universities currently approved uh, by the FDA or other um, in other countries, the the uh, similar institute uh, regulatory bodies that have approved these studies uh, using psilocybin um, for studies. So this is an astonishing number of universities that have gone to peer review the IRB boards, institutional review boards, juried by physicians to make sure that the, the studies are uh, make sense, whether uh, they're safe, uh, whether there is a, f a good uh, probability of favorable outcome. Um, and given the preponderance of ev evidence, um, look at this, Harford, Harvard, Stanford, Stanford, the Department of Veteran Affairs, um, Penn State, um, there's numerous universities. So this on psilocybin and psychedelics in general, um, oh, let's see if this is, I had a problem before. Oh, good. And here are some of the institutions um, just involved in psilocybin research in North America. And there you have NYU, you're mm -hmm. in the Hudson Valley, so the New York uh, University School of Medicine, uh, Yale University, the University of California, San Francisco, John Hopkins, the US Department of Veteran Affairs is interesting. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, this is where this is the foundation of science that we're standing upon. So uh, all the critics out there, and I gave a, a talk at Stanford Medical School, and and my um, my partner is a physician, and when I they mentioned that I was going to be talking about psilocybin mushrooms, there's a few physicians that kind of snickered in the audience, going, "Oh God, here we go," um, and then I show these slides. And they're like deer and headlights. Many of the other physicians applauded. These few physicians sneered. And then they suddenly realized that they were way behind the times. They were uninformed or misinformed. So that's our mission is to show those people who are not familiar with the academic research that this is highly credible. Um, it's just not one or two institutions. I think we're up to 47 institutions worldwide. Um, and this is in, in Europe, uh, the Imperial College of London, King's College of London, Manchester, mostly in England, mm -hmm. uh, a few other ones as well, Helsinki and elsewhere. So this is indeed a worldwide movement. So those skeptics out there, I, 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 I applaud skepticism. <laughs> and I've gone, I have published frequently. And I, you know, those of you who've gone through peer review, published peer review journals, I think most of us agree that some of the peer review comments are just snotty and inappropriate and insulting, but a good portion of them are quite good. And it makes you think, and it makes you sharpen your argument. So um, the, these institutions now uh, as a group, as a chorus of, uh, of commonality of purpose, interest, and now results that show that psilocybin mushrooms and psilocybin therapy can have enormous societal benefit. So um, I'm gonna show, if I can, I'm gonna show with permission uh, two short little videos, okay? Ooh, yeah, yeah. Okay, this is from the Theracell movement. I'm on a remote island in British Columbia. I've been here in basically quarantine. I, I have, a, my bubble is four people. <laughs> I so, and many of us, I so miss hugging people, even strangers, you know, that come up and just give a hug that I just, but I'm 
I'm in six months now in quarantine. We do a lot of Zoom calls. Um, but I, I've been supportive of the Thistle movement, which is basically the right of terminal um, cancer patients and other patients uh, to reconcile um, the fact that they're dying and, and what is the meaning of life. Um, and it's really important that we get to choose our exit. You know, when you're dying, you shouldn't have to be living in fear of being thrown in jail. They have five days to live or a week. I mean, that's ridiculous, right? What prosecutor wants to go down in history is a person throwing a terminal cancer patient in jail because they want to experiment with psilocybin. I, I would advise those listening in that position, it's not a good career move. <laughs> so, but anyhow, this, this woman speaks from the heart. And I think it's very important that you hear, you see this because her words and her, her life story is beyond anything that I could even come to uh, describe. That was very, it's very difficult to get, to wrap your head around. I'm, I'm dying. The chances are that I'm not gonna be around in a couple of years. I heard about a network in Vancouver therapists who are uh, treating patients with psilocybin, patients with anxiety and deal, who are dealing with life and death issues. And I thought that really sounds interesting to me and, and there's no danger. I'm there with two other people in the room. And uh, so it's something I want to, it's worth trying because I, I need to be able to enjoy my life. And all of a sudden, everything was light and, and beautiful and warm. And, and uh, I felt just this rush of warmth and love and, and just peace come over me as, as the lights came up. I'm so fortunate that I had those connections that I heard about this uh, network of therapists that are willing to risk their licenses to treat people with this drug that's not, not legal. And I think it's so wrong that people don't have access to this because people are in pain and dying and uh, or PTSD or depression and which studies show psilocybin helps all of those things and why are we not allowing people to have this drug but we allow them to have other drugs that are so harmful we have given people the right to die um, and and I think that's great it's I don't know if I'll be brave enough to choose that option if the time comes um, but it's there for people when they, if they need it. But what about living? What do we do in between that part, in the process of dying? It's a long process sometimes. So how are we gonna help people through it? Do we want people to be living with the anxiety and fear? Or do we wanna provide them a way to be able to deal deal with things that need to be dealt with in their life that are painful and hard, um, but also to be able to experience the love and joy and peace that, that this has provided to me and to other people that I've talked to. This trip actually changed everything for me because now I'm able to live each day just with peace, joy, and love every day, and and not have this thing weighing on me. I feel so much healthier and lighter in a, in a way, even though I have this thing inside me that could kill me. But like I said, today I'm not gonna die. I'm good, <laughs> and that's all. That's all any of us have.
So the Theracell movement is a, a therapeutic uh, use of psilocybin uh, for end of life. Uh, and there's an exemption in the Canadian law uh, for the emergency use of drugs that have not been approved. Um, and the exemptions are being given now, I think to five or more patients. And so the movement here in Canada is frankly ahead of the United States. I would say the United States may be ahead academically just in sheer numbers of clinical studies, but the government of Canada is uh, looking at this at the federal level and the United States looking at, at the state level. Uh, so um, it's really interesting that the Canadian government is uh, forward, more forward uh, viewing on this than currently the United States government at the federal level. But I have one other video I'm going to, and then I'm going to blast on through this, but I really want to show you something that's super important that's cutting edge research that we are just beginning to unveil. But here's another short video and it features uh, us truly. There's two things certain in life. We are born and we die. Where do we come from? Where are we going? With the psilocybin mushroom experience, you suddenly know that you're part of a giant oneness. And it gives you context and consolation about your own mortality. So I think it's critically important that at the end of your life, you have a right to these substances. Who dares say that you do not? When these have been used for thousands, probably tens of thousands, maybe millions of years, and laws have been created to ostracize people to use them only in the past 50 years? I mean, it's, it's, it, it's not only academically naive, it's immoral. And it's, I, I think that everyone has a right to how they're gonna leave this life. So um, I'm gonna skip through a whole bunch of slides just for the sake of time. Um, but I do want to um, show you some of the research that we've been doing that is quite profound. And we all are gonna suffer from neurodegeneration with age, dementia, neuropathies, uh, oftentimes Alzheimer's. And many of us unfortunately know of elders who uh, their encyclopedic knowledge has now uh, been lost. And uh, how many Einsteins a day are we, we lose to dementia and Alzheimer's? It's it's a tragedy of life when you have these, these elders with so much experience and so much knowledge and wisdom to convey, uh, but they literally become speechless. Um, they're not able to articulate and pass on the knowledge. So uh, a mushroom called lion's mane is very, um, has a long history of use. Hey. <laughs> and um, lion's mane mushroom is, has, has three clinical studies uh, showing that it uh, enhances um, not only just neurogenesis, but in the clinical studies, um, helps to offset the decline uh, towards dementia. I'm, I'm saying that very carefully. Um, there are some Alzheimer studies uh, clinically ongoing currently with lion's mane. I'm privy to the results, uh, but I'm restricted by professional confidentiality to describe them. But the, the studies that have been published show an increase in cognitive function, uh, a slowing and the decrease of, de of dementia. And it is a smart mushroom, a lion's mane mushroom is widely available. Um, but I wanna show you some of the results that we have had with lion's mane uh, mycelium. And this is really an important chart to look at very carefully. This is, we use a company called Neurofit that is preclinical research for Alzheimer's drugs for anti-Alzheimer's drugs in France. Uh, we've done this, I think, six times now. So this is not a one-off experiment. Um, and we have the control of the number of neurites. And these are pluripotent stem cells that are grown in vitro. It's a standard test. And using um, brain-derived nerve growth factors. Um, and these are derived from the, the, the endoplastic reticulum. Um, which is basically young neurons that are extracted um, and the BDNF of these brain neuro growth factors stimulate neurons into proliferation. So you have the control, you have the BDNF, which increases uh, neurogenesis here by this definition by about 15%. And then we have the lion's mane mycelium that then we introduced and it increased uh, 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 neurological proliferation by about 8%. But interestingly, the fruit body actually 
slowed neurogenesis below baseline. This is a real important thing that people know. I believe the mycelium is the immune system of the mushroom. And even though mushrooms are very dense in protein, there's lots of research on beta-glucans and traditional Chinese medicine is based basically on fruit body or mushroom extracts. You know, the emerging scientific uh, studies now are showing that the mycelium, which has to navigate through an ecosystem for days, months, years, um, separated by one cell wall on the other side of which are these pathogens. Mushrooms are laminated mycelium, hundreds or thousands of laminates thick and the mycelium is just a thread and yet is able to prevent pathogens. So it upregulates um, immune genes, uh, defensive genes, antibacterial compounds. And so the compounds that are in lion's mane mycelium called aranacines were first discovered by a doctor named Kawagishi. He first published this in the early 1990s. He was looking for antibacterial agents. Um, because of this ability of lion's mane mycelium to res resist bacteria. And he stumbled into these compounds that cause nerve growth. And so these nerve growth compounds are named after the mushroom Herisium arenaceus called arenaceans. Um, so, and so we, that, so we, okay, we have good results. Interesting that fruit body extracts, <laughs> people take note, you probably don't want to take a fruit body extract if you're concerned about cognitive function, okay? <laughs> this, is, this is kind of a bombshell, but it's, we have seen this. Other researchers reported the same thing. In contrast, the other side of that coin, so to speak, is the benefits from the mycelium. So then we started taking psilocybin analogs. For many years, I was covered by a Drug Enforcement Administration license uh, through the Evergreen State College under my mentor, Dr. Michael Bug, uh, for whom I will forever give credit for mm -hmm. helping my me and my career and my life. So we're doing the same thing now. Now the BDNF has increased neurogenesis even more, 42%, there's a control. There's a lion's mane mycelium and it increases to 11%. Well, before it was 8%. So it's a 3% difference, it's within the margin of error. And then we have three psilocybin analogs that are present in the mushrooms which are legal analogs, baocystin, norobaocystin, and norcilocin. Mm. And we were quite surprised and delighted uh, that they also increased uh, neurogenesis. You know, one of them, um, 29%, that's a significant um, uh, rise uh, over the baselines. So we started wondering, well, wait a second, you know, what if we um, stack these? And so we took one of these analogs and the psilocybin mycelium, and again, now this time it's 114, 115%. It's still within that range. Of, so these are reproducible results. Um, and then we have this interesting little analog that only increased uh, 7% over baseline. So you add those two together and you'd think the cumulative additive effect, if they were acting different receptors or compounding, uh, you'd expect 22% increase. We found 36%. Wow. So it shows synergism, the entourage effect. Mm. Um, this is something we're really excited about, stacking uh, lion's mane with psilocybin mushrooms, which contain these all these analogs. The pure psilocybin that's being used in the majority or all of the clinical studies that I know of right now is just one molecule. Mm. But we haven't evolved to uh, respond to one molecule. I mean, we do have receptors you know, penicillin is a great antibiotic, you know, so the magic bullet single molecule approach has definitely proven its efficacy. But when we're talking about immune systems or brain uh, neurogenesis, uh, it's not just a simple, single molecule response that will necessarily get you over uh, the goal line, which is be, for all of us to become wiser mm. as we become older, mm. okay? And that's the take home here is we want to preserve and culture Einstein's. I think these are Einstein molecules. Mm. I think they increase intelligence. And so we started, and so now we have been doing work with Rudy Tanzi at Harvard Medical School. And he has found that lion's mane uh, and another mushroom we're working with have very, very potent anti-inflammatory uh, effects. So this is important because uh, Rudy is an Alzheimer's uh, researcher and neuroinflammation that's associated that is can be seen with Alzheimer's patients 
uh, erodes the myelin sheath, uh, causes neuropathies, dying back of neurons. Um, this causes collateral damage because of necrotic tissue, challenges the immune system. You know, it's just a slippery slope, you know, unfortunately into neural degeneration. So we're working with Harvard Medical School as well. I have a lot more to say about this, um, but again, out of professional courtesy to my fellow researchers, we have multiple research papers that we're planning uh, to publish. So mm. folks, brace for impact. You know, Stamets is coming on the scene in a huge way, which is going to take people by surprise. I've been sort of in a sense keeping my powder dry, so to speak, uh, so, so I can enter into this in a huge way, but I have to do it methodically uh, and with the intentions true to the spirit of the mushrooms. Mm. I feel like I shepherd something far more valuable than myself. Um, let me, so <clears throat> we have a, Oh, Pardon, yeah. that's a marijuana. This is a famous a marijuana salmon topic. stack. <laughs> oh, this is a salmon stack I've been hearing about for years. <laughs> yeah, so I came up with a stack of using uh, psilocybin mushrooms, which concludes those other analogs with lion's mane, uh, mycelium, um, and vitamin B3. Now, um, we already know the reason for the psilocybin analogs um, in lion's mane, but vitamin B3 is interesting because I wanted to create a microdosing formula that could not be abused, so it could be over the counter. And any of you have taken more than 50 or 100 milligrams of niacin, you've experienced a niacin flush. Yeah. Anybody who doesn't know, know this, go out and get some vitamin B3, take 200 milligrams of niacin, <laughs> don't call me in the morning, <laughs> and half an hour later, you'll start itching, you'll flush red, beet red, You know, it's really irritable, you wanna take off all your clothes, the clothes make you itch. But you're exciting, you're exciting um, the endpoints of the nerves. So the idea for me was if I, if typically many neuropathies occur when there's a deadening uh, of the, the fingertips and the toes. So um, if the vascular system is still intact, then if you can deliver, deliver niacin, which is a natural vasodilator, uh, also has anti-inflammatory properties, then it can carry the neurogenic agents that I'm mentioning here within lion's mane and psilocybin mushrooms mm -hmm. to the endpoints of the nervous system causing neurogenesis. Um, so it is something, I says, it's a formula. Now, I will say that I've had to send seven cease and desist letters to companies using my name without my permission, without even asking me, <laughs> without even the courtesy of asking me, just trying to exploit a market niche blasting my name on their websites, on their bottles. I have four examples of my name on bottles. Oh God. <laughs> now, now folks will go, well, you're well known, you're a celebrity, you know, that comes with the territory. No, it doesn't. If I like somebody, you know, if you wrote a book, somebody put their name on, on your book and they started selling it, right? Cool. You are an artist, you painted something, someone then erased your name and put their name on your painting and something. Okay, folks, it, it doesn't matter uh, what level this is. It's just just moral and, and it's wrong. So thankfully they've taken them down. I'm, I'm you know, was it plagiarism is the yeah. worst form of flattery? Yeah, yeah. Um, whatever. So, but there's a Fadiman protocol. My dear friend, Jim Fadiman, um, he does uh, three days off um, or one day on, two days off. Uh, one day on. So he's got a, every three, three days you do it. Uh, I'm, I'm looking at it differently. I'm four days to five days, four days on, then two days off. And the idea being, um, and this is the big difference between a macrodose and a microdose. Macrodoses can you give the hero's journey. Very good for PTSD, obviously, the revelations of life, end of life, etc. Well, the macrodoses, you have the added responsibility of set and setting safety. Many people don't want to be outside, you know, uh, without without having medical support. They want to be in a protected hospital-like environment. Well, that means tens of thousands of dollars. So my idea is the microdosing allows for the unanimity of use. It democratizes the use of psilocybin. It's subsensorium which means it literally it means below the threshold of you sensing anything. So you don't need to have the medical support teams, et cetera. And then because 
your neurons, as you saw from research, you know, where you're growing these over time. How many cell divisions do you have with your nerves in a six hour window? Well, obviously not too many hmm. compared to over several weeks. And so the idea is to rebuild, you know, um, and neuro regeneration over time, stopping it so the receptors get washed. So your endogenous ability to reconstruct and rebuild neurons can still be uh, in place. And then, then you re-stimulate it. Now, this is totally speculative. This is a best guess, a hypothesis that we need to prove. Mm -hmm. But let's not got, get lost in the weeds here because there are some very interesting examples mm -hmm. of this. And this is what I wanna bring you to. We have a app that I, full disclosure, I'm a super minority owner mm -hmm. um, in this. I contributed money to help them develop the app is by quantified citizens for phones it's at microdose.me. It's a free app. Um, and this is about 30 seconds of the app working. It's anonymized, it's gone through peer review um, and you sign up and it's a daily thing it's about microdosing, what you're microdosing with, mm -hmm. how much you're taking. Um, and then as a series of, 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 of tests, um, it's asking if you stacked it with lion's mane, with niacin, chocolate, which is wonderful. And then you have a memory test of watching the flowers and you have to retype it. Uh, and then you have an accumulative score building. You also have hearing test. You have also a, 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 a test for your sight. Um, and as numerous other sort of challenges. Um, so lots of different possibilities. Now I announced this um, on the Joe Rogan show mm -hmm. and we got tens of thousands of thousands of subscribers. And so um, to define what a microdose is, is subsensorium, and with Slosomy this is about a 10th of a gram, but in the respondents, there's over 12,000 people that participated in this meta study, you know, uh, describing their experiences, low dose, medium dose, high dose. So, um, high dose above a third of a gram. I get lift off at a third of a gram. Um, it's, it's, it's not a microdose. In my my microdose is, is, is the smallest tip of my pinky. I go like this. <laughs> Folks, use, use a scale. <laughs> I had a really good friend who, who dosed me and he puddled me <laughs> twice. I've I go, you're, you're a physician. You're a doctor. You're a physician. <laughs> I did that to my Burning Man camp. <laughs> <laughs> I macro oh, them by accident. <laughs> Get a scale. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I understand the, the fingertip stuff, but you know, for the sake of science, we kind of want to know the dose. Okay. So um, anyhow, so this is the number. Most people were in the mid-range, a tenth of a gram to a third of a gram, 72% of the respondents. Okay. Now you have to understand, this is a large study sample, okay? 3,486 psilocybin users, 447 LSD users and other. Um, and we also had uh, people who are not microdosing. So people who are not doing anything, and they're just charting, you know, their, mm. their mental agility state of mind, you know, for several months. Um, so the window of this is about three months. But we're going to talk about the one month window because we have that data back. So um, we have 83 non microdose uh, users. Now, the, there's a disproportionality of, disproportionality of men to women. This may likely be an artifact that more uh, people, more men listen to Joe Rogan mm -hmm. than, than women. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of men who do. But I mean, it's, it's so that's, that's a little bit of a bias there. But look at this the non microdoses versus the microdosers on depression wow. and look in one month's time mm -hmm. with the non microdosers there's almost the blue, dark blue line there's almost no change in the das 21 scale this is the depression and anxiety and stress scale it's a well-known testing of uh, the scale that psych psychologists and psychiatrists use the p-value significance is is hugely significant mm -hmm. for those who don't know about p-values a p-value of 0.05 gives you 95 percent confidence the data is strong. Mm. 0 0.01, 99%. 0 0.001, 99.9%. 0 
confidence the data is strong. So, so this is this is huge. Um, and um, now we go to mood. Well, the statistical significance on mood is even greater. Mm. So those people who are non-users, the their positive mood uh, did not substantially increase. Those who are microdosing, it massively increased. Look at the statistical value of significance on both wow. of these. Extraordinarily high. Amazing. Now, this is not from Sils. This is, you know, a well-known company has gone public and they're they're trying to market pure psilocybin for treatment resistant depression. Um, and that's commercial push is to me has a lot of problems. Um, is trying to corral and monopolize uh, the use of psilocybin uh, clinically. But no matter what happens with the legalization of psilocybin, 99.9% .9 of people will be using psilocybin mushrooms. Mm. not pure psilocybin as a fact of life folks mm. okay so look at the affordability of psilocybin mushrooms the widespread use and history of their consumption uh and the uh, the affordability now in contrast this is the really different now this is also in depression and this is also with now with lion's mane now we don't see a tremendous difference right now. There's a marginal difference, but it's not statistically significant uh, in stacking with lion's mane, but all the studies with lion's mane went out several months. Mm -hmm. And indeed the newest study on Alzheimer's with lion's mane was 49 weeks. So the window here is on four weeks. And so we are tracking this now longer, but again, you know, the data and the science will lead. Um, so we're seeing if there's a compounded effect here. Um, we'll be able to get, see signal from the noise as the data, data window uh, becomes longer because all the studies with lion's mane uh, were, were beyond four weeks in time. Mm. So uh, the clinical studies were at eight, 12, and 16 weeks, actually in 49 weeks is the latest one. So I think there's four studies then that have been published on lion's mane. So um, I'll skip this very quickly, but what's the advantage of psilocybin mushrooms versus pharmaceutical grade psilocybin? Mm. Well, psilocybin are widely available. They're inexpensive, not controlled by pharmas, can be grown at home, will long familiarity of cultural use, the entourage effect, which I've mentioned, and there's an appeal of using a natural form. The advantages are pretty obvious. Um, you know, they're not available. They're controlled by pharma. Um, and the funding of the investors are motivated by money. Mm -hmm. They can say, we want to do this for the public interest, but their primary interest is the making money, right? So this is what I've seen a lot. A lot of these investment groups are wrapping their cloak yeah. that they want to do this for the commons and for the benefit of humanity and for helping people. Well, you decloak them and they're purely driven by profit. Uh, unfortunately, that's just the way it is, folks. There may be 10% of them out there or a smaller uh, uh, a margin of them, uh, but, but the majority of them by far are driven by profit. Mm. Well, there are disadvantages with psilocybin mushrooms, variability in psilocybin content. Well, that's an interesting thing because if you look at our study, mm. despite the variability in psilocybin content, despite the variability in the dose, despite the variability in the responsiveness, the receptivity, individually uh, of taking these things. Some people feel a strong effect at some same dose, other people feel nothing at all. So despite those confounding variables, we still have statistical significance uh, um, better than any pharmaceutical medicine approved for psychiatry ever in the history of medicine. Mm. So we are working now, you know, Zach Walsh, uh, my partner, Dr. Pam Crisco, uh, and other researchers uh, associated with the University of British Columbia. Uh, we have a paper that we're writing for this, but this is earth shattering, I think, in the psilocybin movement, uh, showing that you do not need a pure pharmaceutical and you use the subsensorium and getting statistical significance that would make any medical clinical study, um, you know, going through peer review is to be an extraordinarily uh, positive outcome. Mm. There is a way through the FDA 
for the, getting botanical drugs approved. This is something that we're on the path of. Um, we are applying for a DEA license uh, to be able to develop this. Um, you know, again, stacking, microdosing with mm. niacin. Um, this is something I'm very passionate about, and I'm uh, I, I like being a disruptor. <laughs> yes. So, uh, all the farmers out there, you know, as a and the nice thing about I, I enjoy this, you know, I've been a market artist all my life. I have the Aikido approach, uh, but I like being the David versus the Goliath. Um, <laughs> it's something that I have a knack for, I think. Mm -hmm. And also, I feel a very deep responsibility. So I say this with humor, but truly um, with sincerity that it's important that we shepherd this knowledge for the benefit of the spirit of the mushrooms, our ancestors for First Nations and Indigenous people all over the world mm -hmm. and throughout history, whose belief these substances have been subjugated and they've been persecuted because, because of them. Mm -hmm. So we need leaders in the field who have a voice uh, for nature and a voice for the mushrooms. Um, so I want to say something else, but I, I, I can't say it right now. So <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> Is it secret or? Um, oh. So anyhow, I see this people medicine versus profit medicine. Yeah. So I, I think um, for the people. Yeah. So I think this is truly um, a revolution for the freedom of consciousness. Uh, whether we ever get approved by the FDA for microdosing, et cetera, there's clear societal benefit. Um, those of you see my other talks and we have also, microdose improves, uh, uh, Im improves depression and immunity improves with an improved mood. So there's many studies that show that if you are happier, your immune system is stronger. If you are depressed, your immune system also is depressed. Microdosing could improve your immunological state uh, to be more ready and reactive to pathogens, including viruses. So I have a lead on to this and we're real exciting now in looking at microdosing uh, with uh, COVID patients, with mm -hmm. cancer patients, with people facing end of life. Mm -hmm. Our data set is large enough now, getting larger and larger. We can add more analytical tools and try to disambiguate um, because we get a hundred or more patients in each data set. Um, and we can then begin to make the justification that could microdosing improve immunity that could make conventional drugs better. Now, I'm not gonna say that microdosing is a cure for cancer or anything like that, I'm not even close to that. But I will say there's a very excellent research published in The Lancet and many other journals that show that your emotional state of being influences your immunological state of readiness. Mm -hmm. And if you can improve, happier your immune system is better and we all know this i mean yeah. just intuitively know this yeah. so the idea is that microdosing could be one coefficient variable that could enhance um your outcome uh in a more positive way than not mm -hmm. and so i see life and death as being a formula of coefficient factors strung together uh the inconsequence of which is is um, healthy or health or disease, happiness or depression, and longevity. Mm. So I think this is something we should take very seriously. And I think psilocybin mushrooms should be reinvented as a nootropic vitamin. Mm. So I have, um, I, so go to mushroomreferences.com as an unbranded website, it has enormous amounts of information. I've written it mostly for physicians to take them up the learning curve. All the psilocybin studies are on there, all of them that I know of. The Lion's Man clinical studies on there. I have uh, numerous research articles, and I have also uh, filed six patents in the psilocybin space. Wow. Um, I've done this specifically strategically. It's my invention. It's my knowledge. It's my investment. And there was no one, and I challenge anyone out there to prove me wrong, because I do, I'm in fact based. Has there anyone ever shown that analogs of psilocybin uh, increased neurogenesis prior to our work? I don't think so. We're the first ones on this.
Mm. And I want to create and succeed in these uh, patents as a defensive position uh, for the benefit of the commons. Yeah. And I ask people to trust me uh, <laughs> to make the right decisions for the benefit of the, of the most people possible uh, because I'm up against what I call Darth Vader's and yeah. uh, we're at the beginning of, beginning of spore wars. <laughs> so uh -oh. spore wars are coming, uh, but uh, my shields are up uh, and I am very, very uh, ready for this. Um, and uh, frankly, this, it's spore wars being uh, attacking me and my work from the pharmaceutical companies will give me millions of dollars in advertising yeah. uh, and it will hurt, hurt their brand. So um, I welcome um, I welcome being challenged you know, academically. I welcome being challenged on a level playing field, uh, but I will not tolerate someone doing things deviously uh, and un unethically. I feel like I have to stand up for the people and stand up for the mushrooms, the spirit of the mushrooms to do the right thing. So I, I, I accept that I want that responsibility and I want to perform you know, true to those statements. I hope I can do it. And I'm going to do everything I can. So uh, anyhow, that's pretty much it. Great. Oh, thank you so much. Um, so thank you for saying that at the end, because this is actually one of the number one concerns I've heard over the years where people are concerned about the future of this as, as business, you know, as um, what's going to happen, are we, you know, it's going to legalize, but then it's going to become like any other big pharma. So thank you for your mission and your, um, your shield. Well, there's, there's a few people I want to shout out to, I mean, and companies, um, uh, David Bronner, mm -hmm. you know, you know, uh, Bronner Soap. He's part of the series. I mean, he, I mean, he is phenomenal. He is a, he's truly, truly heroic. Um, he's on a very front cutting edge mm -hmm. and I'm not saying that hundred percent of what David always does is going to be a, a, something I percent agree with, but I'd say about 94.68% <laughs> of what he does. I am like blown away. Um, mm -hmm. and so happy that he's leading the charge and he's walking off, you know, mm -hmm. um, other companies like, uh, Patagonia, yeah. you know, uh, very, very powerful in their social missions. Businesses can be vehicles for good. Mm -hmm. If they're led by people whose primary interest is not making money, but is to fulfill a dream uh, that helps many people as possible beyond themselves. Yeah. And um, so I, I'm excited about this. And uh, we have numerous publications coming out. And this is the tip of the proverbial iceberg. I've hinted at a few things that are huge um, that I'm, I'm aware of right now. And uh, but after my colleagues and I coordinate and publish, then we can have a further discussion. We're so okay. excited. Oh, thank you so much. I just have to say on a personal note, I don't know if you saw me crying. Um, both my father and stepfather have passed in the last, you know, 12, 13 years. And my stepfather from Alzheimer's just a year and a half ago. Um, but my father was a terminal cancer patient who died on pharmaceutical drugs, not aware of me or anything around him because they gave him so much, um, what is it, morphine, morphine drip, and then he just died. And it's just really interesting to watch because I actually feel very strongly about the choice to, to choose our end of life path as a ritual, like any beautiful ritual of life. And, and this video you showed just touched me so much because I actually, I do think this is all intertwined. You know, it's about how do we live? How do we choose to die? And this, this freedom of, you know, life, like freedom to choose another, another way. So thank you so much for this work in this area. It's so important. Well, I think it touches all of us. Um, and it touches not only us and our immediate family, but our friends, our neighbors. We are giant communities and we need to invest in the mental health of our communities to reduce crime, to, to improve health. Um, and so I think these mushrooms are a catalyst for that. Yeah. This is literally an underground revolution for the freedom of consciousness. Our time has come yeah. and it's international, it's worldwide. This is why this movie, Fantastic Fungi, has done so well. It got turned down at cons, it got turned down at Sundance, and yet it's 100% on Rotten Tomatoes. It's the number one leading documentary, you know, mm -hmm. you know uh, on Apple TV and Louis Schwerberg, you know, give a shout out to that brother Louis for 
taking 12 years to produce a film against all odds that has now inspired people as well as Michael Pollan's book mm -hmm. um, and then Joe Rogan. And those, those three, I think, stimuli uh, had a massive influence in helping this movement uh, progress. Yeah. So now we just need to take that. We have to be extremely responsible uh, with what we're doing. So anyone out there that's screwing up, you know, I just recommend you go out there and put your arm around them, kind of crowd them back in, keep them on the rails. We can't go off the rails on this. It's too important. Yeah, no, I really quick before you go, what do you suggest people do to get involved or, you know, join in your mission? Because I know a lot of our listeners feel the same way you do and, and see this as this revolution. What can, what can people do? Well, I mean, the, this important thing to do is to take children on walks into the woods and showing them uh, the invisible networks beneath their feet of mycelium and showing and collect mushrooms and then join a mycological society. Mm. Uh, that is a great wellspring of knowledge and people and personalities is, is cross political. I mean, it's amazing. Some of my best friends I would never have associated with if I knew their political beliefs. But having been in the woods with them and finding, you know, pine mushrooms or, or chanterelles and sharing the joy of that, we built a bridge mm -hmm. where I can now talk to them about political differences respectfully. Mm -hmm. And so what I think mushrooms do, that they're a bridge across cultures and ages, across political divides that brings out the humanity in people mm -hmm. because they have a commonality of the respect for nature. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. So, thank you okay. so much for being here, Paul. Yep. We really appreciate Thanks, you Paul. so much, and we'll send your website out to everybody watching, paulstamets.com. Thank you very much for your time, and everybody, this has been it for this series. We're so glad you've been here and enjoy this. Please share share your beauty and love for these mushrooms, for this medicine, with your community and those around you. I, I believe that this is the domino effect we're all here to create. Thank you, Paul. All right. All right. Bless you all. All right. Take care.